Hi, everybody. I feel like we've, we've made it a long way together. This is our 11th, 13th, I don't know, but we're getting in the double digits. And many of you have been with us since the beginning. And the first thing I want to do is thank you for your continuing support for so long and so many years. And for those of you who are new here, uh, we accept newcomers. We love newcomers. Uh, we're not newcomers. And we know that you newcomers can help keep this sustained. The University of Colorado is the only university in the country that has had the opportunity, because of the gifts from the Colemans, to sustain an emphasis on cognitive disability and technology through a national conference now for, what is it, 13 years? And uh, I, think we're, I think we're pretty much the, en the envy of the academic world in this regard. Uh, there are conferences related to technology. Uh, they're not related to technology and intellectual and developmental disabilities and cognitive disabilities. The easy part of technology and disability is physical and sensory disability, and I say that with utmost respect for the way technology in those arenas has helped advance the independent living um, of individuals with physical uh, disabilities and sensory disabilities. But in our case, the reason that cognitive disability or intellectual disability was delayed in having a focus for so long is really pretty simple. It was too hard was too hard, it was too difficult. There weren't enough trained engineers and, sci and computer scientists and others and people experienced with the life of people with, with intellectual disabilities to get the groundwork done to build a field. So when Enid was thanking the Coleman's, think of it this way, she was thanking the Coleman's for the primary stimulus that helped those of us in this room and those of us who have been in this room for 13 years now to actually build a field on cognitive disability and technology. So we come to a position in their leadership, and I'd like to say the leadership of the University of Colorado, and Leonard Dininger, Vice, Executive Vice President of the University System, we don't use the word system anymore, sorry Leonard, is here today representing the president who couldn't be here. Frankly, I'm glad Leonard's here because I don't know that Leonard's been to one of our conferences in many years. And I hope he'll see today how we've grown. Uh, we've probably taken a step or two back because we are, we are learning as you are our way as we go. And uh, I think we've made progress, but that doesn't necessarily mean the progress has been as consistent as a rocket ship to the moon. We've taken some veers and turns along the way as we've tried to figure out how to provide the kind of leadership that, that we need and that the field needs. So I've been asked to make some just brief comments. They will be brief comments. This won't be a 45-minute lecture. And I was, was expecting to do this extemporaneously. I've been told by a close friend that I do extemporaneous better than planned writing. I want to identify that person, but she's sitting on the second row. <laughs> And so I found myself last night at 1 o'clock in the morning actually writing my remarks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, these, these are really extemporaneous remarks. Just think of me laying in the bed at 1 o'clock in the morning. No, don't do that. <laughs> so here we go. hope I can see it, actually. The word launch, which is what they asked me to talk about, the launch. That's what this is today, the launch. The word launch made me think of John F. Kennedy and his 1961 speech at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Of course, I didn't exactly think of the speech. I, I went to my Kennedy speech book. And then I looked for something that would be inspirational. And sure enough, it was his speech at Rice University. And since I was at the University of Texas, I knew Rice University real well. And so I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll start there. What did he say at Rice? Well, he gave a great speech there about the challenge of space flight and its, its possible rewards. And those of you who are over 63 or 4 years old in this room uh, will probably remember that speech about the frontier of space. And it was done at Rice University. And he said something that made me think his speech at that time was really right for today 
and it was this. We choose to go to the moon because, not because it is easy, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because it is hard. Bill and Claudia Coleman, and those of you and those of us who've worked in the area of cognitive disability and technology, did not choose this area because it was easy. We chose it, and now you have chosen it, because it is hard. But like that commitment to go to the moon, which seemed so impossible at the time, and which became possible, having something to, to try to achieve that is hard has a way of guiding your life, animating your life, bringing all kinds of positive attributes to the way you live and the way you think. So now over these 13 years, what Bill and Claudia have done for us is to give us something that initially seemed almost insoluble and now seems potentially within reach. And like that rocket that went to the moon, we have gravitated. We have gravitated toward the notion of being confident enough to talk about the rights to technology and information access that people with cognitive disabilities have. So our metaphor is like John F. Kennedy's metaphor. I said he gave a great speech, but the best line that I liked in his speech was he said, when he said things needed to be hard to explain that, remember he was at Houston, Texas. He said, why does Rice play Texas in football? <laughs> I thought that was a great line, so I decided to come up with the line. Why does the University of Colorado play Oregon? <laughs> and for those of you from out of town, we're playing Oregon this Saturday. JFK answered his own question. The answer to his own question was essentially that succeeding in selecting the right goal often involves a challenge of significant proportions. But hard challenges yield collateral benefits that typically exceed easier goals you set for yourself, or in this case, for your country. By having a goal of technology and information access, and essentially a right to that, we basically put down our gauntlet as a group, as a movement, and we say, no compromises. We can't say what type of technologies are going to evolve necessarily, but we can say technologies will evolve because when human will uh, is strong enough and science is behind it and effort is behind it and time is behind it, we've learned in American history and history generally that good things happen. And good things are happening. There is progress. But I think we're going to see progress on a geometric mathematical uh, plane going forward in the next 10 years. The 10 years we might have hoped to have had the last 10 years are likely to be this next 10 years in terms of the developments in technology. And now we have a base of people who are interested in technology, you all and others who couldn't be here but still believe in this area. And we realize there really is a field and there really is a reason for people with cognitive disabilities to be central to this field. Now many people think people with cognitive disabilities quite frankly, aren't able to use technology. That's a way of saying we're so primitive in our utilization of technology that we can't, we can't develop it and adapt it and apply it to people with cognitive disabilities. That is on us. It has nothing to do with people with cognitive disabilities. We can figure it out. If we have enough minds to send people to the moon and to, the, and to other galaxies now, we have recently sent uh, a, a piece of the Earth to another galaxy. We have the capacity to move forward aggressively in this area and create great things. Access to technology and information uh, in America, in everyday life, uh, let me start that over again. Access to technology and information is becoming as central to everyday life in America as education has been for generations. Of course, people with cognitive disabilities were excluded from educational opportunities until relatively recently, and it took litigation 
and it took legislation over a generation to begin to level the educational playing field. Now, I don't necessarily think it'll take litigation to level the technology playing field, but if it, if it does, we must be ready because the exclusion of people with cognitive disabilities from the field of, of, of technology is, is tantamount to the exclusion that occurred with respect to education in the last generation. Our speaker, Tom Gilhul, from last year, made that very clear to us. Of course, that's what we asked him to talk on. <laughs> but he, he made it very clear to us that he believed there was a parallel. And I think this year, even more so, we feel there's more of a parallel between the right to education and now the emerging right to technology. Does that mean it's been litigated a lot? No. But it has for people with sensory impairments, people who are blind, people who are deaf. Not so much for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Why? I think it's because we're so shy and timid and we are un unable to assert ourselves. <laughs> that was supposed to get a laugh. I just made that up, too. Because if anything, we are a rights-oriented group, aren't we? We got rights to community services. What the heck do you think a technology is, if not a community and family and individual service? And where do you think we'll be if we don't have younger people coming up, inventing, applying, testing, and moving this area along to keep up with the rest of technology's advancement in American society and throughout the world? I'm going way off of my script. <laughs> you will remember that Tom Gilhul spoke at our conference and told us he thought that information, uh, technology and information access was fast becoming the equivalent of access to education for this generation and for future generations it would be even more critical, possibly rivaling the centrality of educational access for persons in our society. One year after Tom made his remarks to us, we have developed through our pre-conference event a new declaration of the rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access. I would allow, though, that we really didn't use the word declaration. I was a little reluctant to use that, and people started using it, and because I just thought, you know, what we did is this document on the rights, but people started calling this declaration of the rights. We had this aggressive th th that we declare, and uh, I kind of like it right now. And I think that uh, we, we, we now do have a declaration, although we just call the document the rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access. We've prepared an accompanying article for you that we published in AAIDD's new journal called Inclusion. It's an online journal, and you can get instructions outside the room here on how to access it. And there's a copy of this journal uh, uh, a uh, hard copy of this journal in your packet, I believe. The one you're going to get. You're not going to get it yet. We didn't, we didn't want you to read it before I talked. So <laughs> the journal is electronic, and you may use your laptops and phones to access that article when you, before you leave here. We thank the publisher, AAIDD. Uh, we're very grateful for the support that we've received from a number of the associations, AAIDD in particular, and Maggie, wherever you are. Uh, tremendous partner for, for the Institute and for our, our movement. So at this point now, I have the high honor of presenting the rights of people with cognitive disabilities and technology access. And Vanna is going to be the movie. And this is probably going to come tumbling down, because we didn't practice this. Nope. But I have the honor and don't of pulling. Don't turn it over on yourself. Do we have a center out there or a power forward? Okay. okay, I have to read it for you, obviously. 28 million United States citizens have cognitive disabilities such as intellectual disability, severe persistent mental illness, brain injury, stroke, and neurodegenerative orders such as Alzheimer's disease. And whereas, people with cognitive disabilities are entitled to inclusion in our democratic society under federal laws such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, 
the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and under state and federal laws, and whereas the disruptive convergence of computing and communication technologies has substantially altered how people acquire, utilize, and disseminate knowledge and information, and whereas access to comprehensible information and usable communication technologies is necessary for all people in our society, particularly for people with cognitive disabilities, to promote self-determination and to engage meaningfully in major aspects of life such as education, health, health promotion, employment, recreation, and civic participation, and whereas the vast majority of people with cognitive disabilities have limited or no access to comprehensible information and usable communication technologies, and whereas people with cognitive disabilities must have access to commercially available devices and software that incorporate principles of universal design, such as flexibility and ease of use for all, and whereas technology and information access by people with cognitive disabilities must be guided by standards and best practices, such as personalization and compatibility across devices and platforms, and through the application of innovations including automated and predictive technologies, and whereas security and privacy must be assured and managed to protect civil rights and personal dignity of people with cognitive disabilities, and whereas enhanced public and private funding is urgently required to allow people with cognitive disabilities to utilize technology and access information as a natural consequence of their rights to inclusion in our society. Ensuring access to technology and information for the 28 million people with cognitive disabilities in the United States will create, on the positive side as far as industry is concerned, new markets and employment opportunities. It will decrease dependency on public services. It will reduce health care costs and improve the independence, productivity, and quality of life for people with cognitive disabilities. Therefore, we hereby affirm our commitment to equal rights of people with cognitive disabilities to technology and information access. And we call for implementation of these rights with a familiar phrase, deliberate speed. You may view the endorsers so far of this document at Coleman Institute, one word, dot org forward slash declaration. And you may also sign this document. And I believe we're set up to do this here uh, so that be our, our statement, and I'd like to tell you that we wouldn't have presented this if we didn't already have a great number of endorsing organizations and leaders throughout the United States who have signed this document. These include AbleLink Technologies, the Alliance Colorado, an association of 40 developmental disability service providers in this state, making them the first single state where all of the major providers have signed on to this declaration. The American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, the oldest association of intellectual and developmental disabilities leaders in the world. Chartered in, I think it was 1358, wasn't it? <laughs> 1876, at a World's Fair, as I recall. The American Options of Community, the American Network of Community Options and resources, led by Rene Pietrangelo. And this is an association of community providers throughout the United States, and we're so grateful for their signing on, too. Not to mention the ARC. I know I'm not supposed to say the ARC United States. That's not technically their name. But the ARC with responsibility for the entire United States of America. Asset Consulting, the Assistive Technology Partners Program at the University of Colorado, led by Kathy Bodine. The Beach Center on Disability at the University of Kansas, led by Ann and Rudd Turnbull. The Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. The Coleman Colorado Foundation, which is a supporting organization for the Coleman Institute. And Pete Steinhauer, who is on that board with Bill and Claudius here today. Thank you, Pete. Imagine. Imagine was the first provider in Colorado to sign on and, and was a significant part of this. The Institute for Matching Person and Technology. That's at uh, a New York University. 
the Institute on Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago, my former employer, the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities, the National Center on Disability and Access to Education, self-advocates becoming empowered. When we started this process, I feared that perhaps self-advocates would become one of the last people to sign it because they would want to make sure we were doing it right. <laughs> they signed on pretty soon. And we're really proud and, and quite lucky to have self-advocates becoming empowered be among the initial signatories. And another group that's growing significantly, and I predict in this next generation will become as powerful an organization perhaps as the ARC and other organizations, and that's the Sibling Leadership Network. Was there ever a better idea than to think of developing an association of siblings and empower those siblings who end up very often being responsible for helping influence positive lives for their brothers and sisters, to actually organize them, to actually make them a, a, a key group at policy tables? Uh, I don't think so. And we're very lucky to have Shay Tanis on our staff here at the Coleman Institute and at the University of Kansas. And finally, the Westchester Institute for Human Development. A USED, a University Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, and in the New York region, and they have been tremendously supportive. So I thank them. So um, there's no more to read to you. I did my best to digress, and for Claudia, and uh, uh, there's not much more for me to say except uh, thank you for uh, helping us get here. We took us a few years to figure out uh, what we needed to do. And what we need to do is we all need to get behind this declaration. If we find things that uh, are limitations in it, we need to correct them. If we find other things that we can add, we need to add those things. But I see it as a living document, and I see it as a largely democratic document in the sense that we're open to ideas for contributions about who should sign it, and if it should have a process for amending if we discover that we've gotten behind the times, we need to figure that out. But we need to be, at the same time, um, not overly aggressive with the way that we advance this. We need to be um, diplomatic and effective. We need not to offend people, not to be so aggressive that we have people turn back on us and just want to ignore this. A lot of thought and a lot of work, thousands of hours of work has gone into this. We don't want to blow it. So we're still learning. Help us learn through your organization uh, how to advance this properly in a constructive way where people will feel, oh, yeah, I like that. We're moving in that direction anyway, generally in our society. It's important that we incorporate people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, of course. So let's work together, and let's work together with others, and let's get this job done. Thank you.